it's Jim from Janda's Reviews, and today we're going to do my Beauty Reads book review of Michael Crichton's Timeline, which happens to be one of my very all-time favorite books. Um, this was written, I think it was published in 1989, and it's 480 pages long. Um, a little bit about the author himself, Michael Crichton. He wrote... Um, multiple New York Times bestsellers, um, the author of many screenplays. He is the science behind um, the realisticness of um, the TV series ER. Um, he did graduate from Harvard University and uh, received a medical degree from Harvard Medical, although he never practiced medicine. Um, while he was still in med school, that's when he got his first New York Times bestseller with the Andromeda Strain. I don't know if you guys remember that. I can't remember if it was a TV miniseries or something my parents rented from a movie store. I don't know, but I remember watching it and um, fascinated by it. He's also the, um, the author. He wrote the screenplay for Twister. I know a lot of people know that one. Um, Jurassic Park, The Lost World. Everything past that is um, has nothing to do with Mr. Crichton, Dr. Crichton, whatever you want to call him. Um, timeline. They did make that one into a movie as well, but it was the worst. It's just a really horrible movie, so don't bother watching it. Read the book. It's way better. Um, Jurassic Park is really good, but the book is way better. <laughs> um, anyway... Uh, he passed away in uh, 2008 from lymphoma. He did not announce to the public that he was even sick. Um, died in the middle of his chemotherapy. Um, <clears throat> but Stephen King sums it up perfectly. So I'm going to read a quote here from him. Um, As a pop novelist, he was divine. A Crichton book was a headlong experience <clears throat> driven by a man who is both a natural storyteller and a fiendishly clever, and fiendishly clever, when it came to verisimilitude. He made you believe that cloning dinosaurs wasn't just over the horizon, but possible tomorrow, maybe today. Stephen King on Michael Crichton, 2008. Anyway, that pretty much sums it up. His books... And I'm, I'm assuming it's because of his um, medical background and um, his absolute brilliance. He, uh, he does. He makes the science sound completely plausible. And um, the theory in timeline, it is um, time travel, but not in the way that, you know, like back to the future kind of thing. Um, it is more... Uh, it's quantum mechanics and that there is a multiverse rather than an actual traveling to the past as it happened. It's the past as it probably happened in one of our multiverses. And you achieve this by, um, as they describe it in the book, they basically, a machine breaks you down here and reconstitutes you back in one of the past multiverses. Um, in this case, it's medieval, feudal France. Um, it's during the Hundred Years' War. So, uh, you know, kind of like a fax machine. Although the original is, is destroyed. <clears throat> but when you come back, it just reverses the process. It breaks you down from where you were in the multiverse and reconstitutes you back in your present time. It's a fascinating read, and of course the book describes the whole process far better, and it's sprinkled all throughout the book with all these quotes that make it sound like um, he has pulled this science out of modern day um, publications, and a lot of half are true, half. The other half are complete crap made up by him. And um, it's just part of the joy of the book. It's just get, it's sprinkled with all kinds of really odd and interesting quotes. Um, one of the fake quotes 
that I loved is um, the glory of the past is an illusion. So is the glory of the present, Edward Johnston. <clears throat> and how you know this one is fake. <laughs> This Edward Johnston is the professor leaving, leading an archaeological dig in the story. He's one of our main um, characters. Okay, so on with the show. <clears throat> this time around, since I remembered not to put any makeup on before I decided to start this video, I'm going to just, you know, I'm just going to put on my makeup, get ready for the day kind of thing. Please excuse my sniffles. It's going to be worse than normal. I know I sniffle through all my videos, but this is the middle of allergy season for me. Um, I am allergic to, <clears throat> excuse me, goldenrod and mold. And it's fall, and the mold count is already starting to, to rise. So I'm sniffling constantly. So sorry about that. Okay, so the book. It starts out with um, a couple, the Bakers, and they are traveling through um, the New Mexico desert, and um, the wife thinks that they have hit a man who appears out of nowhere, while the husband is pretty darn sure that they just hit a pothole. But needless to say, doing the right thing, they uh, they stop, and the old guy, the, he doesn't appear injured, but he is acting very disoriented and a little out of it. So they decide to take him to the hospital and get him checked out, because the wife is still convinced that they hit him, and it's going to be a lawsuit if they don't. <clears throat> so they head to the nearest Big Town, which is, um, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, I'm sure, Gallup, G-A-L-L-U-P, New Mexico, and um, they take them there, they explain everything, the local police are called, they inspect the car, no damage is found, so the couple can go home after being there for a few hours and telling them, you know, what they found, which was basically the guy, no car anywhere, they couldn't figure out where he, he appeared from. Um, so, uh, oh, and one thing, when the husband was searching to see if there was a car, trying to figure out where the guy came from before they took off, he finds, um, a small ceramic piece, and it's stamped ITC, and, um, it's just a, a one-inch square of white ceramic. <clears throat> So, he doesn't know what it is, but it's right beside the dude's footprints. And um, the footprints just appear out of nowhere also. So, that's all he knows. Reports it to the police. And then they leave. <clears throat> they get the guy stabilized. He's talking all kinds of crazy nonsense. Um, most of it, when he does talk, rhymes. Which, they're not sure what's going on with him. Um, they take his fingerprints, they have to strap him to the gurney, um, they sedate him with a light sedative, um, they do an MRI scan, and, uh, before they get the MRI results back, he, um, starts to yell and then sits up in the gurney, wild-eyed, quote-unquote, and vomits blood, and it fills his oxygen mask. It's running down his, you know, outside of it, running down his chest. They, um, they of course try to save him, but they can't. He, he ends up passing away. So there's that. Um, so they do get his fingerprints. <clears throat> They come back, and he is a um, world-renowned um, physicist who works with um, metals. So they suspect, you know, that um, some of the crazy talk could have been um, some kind of um, toxicity from working with the metals. They're not really sure what's going on with that. But 
um, needless to say, his MRI results come back and they're bizarre because it looks like half of his body doesn't line up with the other half, including his heart, which is where all the blood started coming from. But they decide that it's just some kind of problem with the MRI machine because that doesn't make any kind of sense. The dude was in his 70s. Um, they find out that ITC is the company that he was working for. And remember, ITC is what's stamped on a little piece of ceramic. So they call up the company and notify them that they, um, Dr. Traub, who's the old guy who dies, um, he was found wandering in the desert and they say that um, he has no living relatives, that his wife died about a year ago and that he had been um, very depressed lately and um, to send any of his effects with them and that they would arrange to have his body picked up after the autopsy is completed because an autopsy has to be done because he died in the ER um, vomiting blood, which was not a natural cause. Not sure why somebody that's 72 has to have an autopsy. Maybe it was the whole vomiting blood thing. They don't exactly explain that one. But anyway, so they send his clothing, a little ceramic, and what they find in his pockets is a little diagram, and it's, uh, it's like a grid work dots with lines and stuff, and they're not exactly sure what it is, but at the bottom corner it says M-O-N dot S-T-E dot M-E-R-E. And they, they suspect because it is laid out, you know, in a cross pattern, which most monasteries and Catholic churches are, that it is a church. They can't find a church, and they can't figure out what it has to do with anything. So, of course, it gets sent on. Uh, back to the company. So... Um, You flip forward to the company. Robert Doniger, who is the president and CT CEO of this um, ITC. And Diane Kramer, who is his attorney who handles most of the things. And um, Dr. Gordon, who is former military. And he has... Um, he signed on and is also a vice president of the company, as is Ms. Kramer. Um, they've all invested heavily into this ITC company, which stands for International Technology Corporation. Um, Robert Doniger is a megalomaniac, a billionaire. This is his third startup, and um, he's a complete asshole. There's just no other word for it. You'll hate him. Everybody hates him. He's just a complete jerk. Um, needless to say, he's a brilliant jerk. And it gives all kinds of uh, background and uh, details on him. And uh, he has a company. And they don't, they don't give a lot of the details about this company. But it's enough to make you really curious. And uh, he's talking about they've got a burn rate on the technology that they're developing. And it's very, very high. And he can't get any more out of his current board of directors um, who have all contributed $300 million dollars. So, he's already burnt through all of that, plus his own personal, um, you know, kick in, whatever. Uh, his own personal investment into his own company. So, he is trying to convince this board to add on three more board to their board of directors with, you know, another investment of $300 million, which would be $900 million, almost a billion dollars. Uh, 
but he is telling, you know, Diane and Dr. Gordon, who are handling Dr. Traub's disappearance and subsequent death in New Mexico. Um, they are in Black Rock, Mexico, which is supposed to be really close to um, Los Alamos. Don't know if there actually is one. It's probably all made up, but I didn't bother looking to see. Um, anyway, so he, Doniger has like a never-ending supply of um, physicists and um, technical engineers and such for, for his company. Um, so anyway, to get on with it, he doesn't need Traub's problems right now while he's trying to get more money for his company and he decides they need a win and he's saying one of the projects has got to be close enough that they can present it as a win to the board of directors to make it more appealing to add on to the board which this all will start to make sense as I go I'm sorry I know it's very disjointed at the, at the moment so <clears throat> So, um, they arrange, Dr. Traub's body is picked up, um, the stuff is sent back to them, uh, they have the body cremated immediately because they know they call them transcription errors and that he made too many trips, and that's why he has so many transcription errors. Um, he had snuck in to do maintenance, supposedly, on the machines, and, um, instead of doing maintenance, took a trip back and accumulated more transcription errors, which led up to the body misalignment. So, need a Diet Coke, sorry. Um, so they've got all of that taken care of, wrapped up nice, neat with a bow. Body's cremated, so, you know, there's nothing to go back to when the MRI shows what happened. And it seems weird, there's nothing to check it against, so they have to assume it was a MRI error. So, they need a win. They've got several projects going on, and Doniger sends Miss um, Kramer to the Dord Dordogne. I had to look up how to pronounce that too, by the way. You all should be proud. In the southwest of France. <clears throat> they are excavating a site. Um, it's Castle Guard and... Shoot, I've forgotten the name of the other castle. They're opposing. It's the Hundred Years' War where England is against France. They're both vying for a hundred years. And it's all along rivers. Um... At this time, England owned most of France. It's weird. Look it up. It's a bizarre history twist, which is why I love European history. It's fascinating. But along this river, one side was held by the English. The opposing side would be held by the French. And they would have opposing castles to defend that territory against the other. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Constantly, all up and down. Um, various rivers, valleys, whatever. Um, what was the name of that other one? I wrote it down, so hang on. Castle Guard, oh, La Roque. And um, in the Dordogne River and the Dordogne Valley uh, in the Perigord region. So, Professor Johnston from... Um, Shoot, I just went blank. The same place Robert Langdon teaches and all the Da Vinci Code stuff. Uh, Yale. He is a professor of history at uh, Yale University and has been working three years on this um, excavation in Dordogne um, at the Monastery of St. Mier. Remember that diagram? M-O-N-S-T-E-M-R-E. M-E-R-E. -E. That's what it is. It's a monastery. Um, and this is uh, a monastery that was burnt down in 1437? No, 1357. Excuse me. 
1357 feudal France. Um, they have sketched out a little bit of the property of Castle Guard. Um, haven't even begun on La Roque. Um, everything, of course, is a tumbled down mess. Not a lot remains. They suspect that there was a mill at the monastery that ran the um, length of the river, spanned it, you know, and had water wheels to help with the mill production of flour and other grains. So they've been working there for a while. His main team is um, David Stern, who is IT, Andre Merrick, who is not, he's the only one not from Yale out of the um, graduate students that are working for uh, Professor Johnston. Um, he is on loan from, I've gone blank again. Anyway, he's Dutch, on loan. He's also um, a professor of history. Uh, David Stern, Andre Merrick, Chris, I've forgotten his name. I've written everything down here. Chris Hughes, he's a graduate student in the history of science, which is basically working <clears throat> backward from our current sciences and figuring out how we arrived to this point, especially since um, there's very little, what do I say, um, art. So there's no pictures of how things work. There are written things, but that's about it. And they're not very descriptive. So they have no idea what things actually looked like. And he is the one who was working on the mill project with um, having water wheels to help propel the mills that grind the grain into flour and such. So um, he's in charge of that one. Then they've got Kate Erickson. And... She is a graduate student who has just transferred into the archaeology department, but her background is in architecture. So she is um, their structural expert on this dig. And then there is um, Elsie. I didn't write her name down. I should have. I thought I would remember it, but I can't remember her last name. Anyway, Elsie is um, a graphologist. So she is interpreting all the documents, the pieces of parchment and vellum that they find and what all was written and scanning it. And then that's where David Stern comes in with IT, you know, keeping all those scans collected of all this paperwork. Um, but she's translating everything because uh, even if you spoke English, you wouldn't be understood in today's time. Um, it was a blend of Old English and um, French. And uh, the French spoken is nothing like modern French. It's uh, very regional. And in this region, it's Occitan, which is O-C-C-I-T-A-N. Just for y'all, all the background. Um, anyway. So, they are... I didn't do any of that. Oh, well, it's okay. Not important. Getting sidetracked, sorry. Um, so these students are um, digging, and Ms. Kramer shows up at the dig wanting to do an inspection and see where they're at and see what they can video and show as progress towards um, getting the new board well, to add on to the board with new members. Okay, y'all got that. I'm not going to keep repeating it. So she's there to do an inspection and see how far along they are. And um, I'm looking for a brush. Just bear with me. I swear I get to the point eventually. <clears throat> um. They take her on a helicopter ride. Andre is a helicopter pilot. Pilot. Um, he is a new breed of historian where he actually 
immerses himself into the history that he studies, which is feudal France. And um, from that point, you know, he has learned how to joust. He has um, learned the languages spoken at the time, the customs. Um, you know, he rides because he's learned to joust. He's learned to, to ride horseback. Um, working on armor, uh, shoots with a long bow, and not a modern one. Um, what would have actually been used in feudal France. So, like I said, he, he lives the history in present time. So, <clears throat> and he just happens to be a helicopter pilot. There, it's a it's a dual purpose. He flies her overhead and points out where they have started on things, and um, also is scanning the ground for um, future excavation sites. So they've got some kind of technical equipment that I can't even begin to start to describe attached to the bottom of the helicopter. So they're also doing scans as he shows her um, the topography at the at the site. So they land and she meets up with Dr. Johnston and they're talking about the progress and if there's anything that they need, you know, that her company can supply because they're the ones funding this project fully. And he's like, no, 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 you've been more than generous. You know, we've got um, far more than we ever expected to get. You know, we're um, way more advanced than technology and, you know, yada, yada. And then she's asking why more hasn't been done and mentions the towers of Castle Guard, which they haven't discovered. So everybody starts perplexed, but they keep it to themselves. They just kind of hush it up. Um, don't pay attention to it that much, or at least they act like it. And... Um, The grad students are listening in on the whole conversation between, excuse me, Ms. Kramer and Professor Johnston because he prefers it that way. So he's got them listening in. And um, sorry. So they're listening in on the conversation and they hear the, the comment about the towers and they're all just kind of like, what? And Professor's just playing it cool, like no big deal. Like he knows exactly what she's talking about. Just kind of blowing it off. Well, everybody else, they immediately are like, what tower? So they go looking along the outlines away from where Professor Johnston and Miss Kramer are. And... Lo and behold, they find the outline of a tower, completely overgrown, and then they start to check the scans. There's no scans whatsoever that reveal the outline of the stonework underneath. It's just a complete mystery how this chick knew about this. So, Professor Johnston gets quite upset and demands to know what the hell's going on and he goes back with her to ITC in New Mexico and says you know that he'll be back in three days time well while he's gone while they're excavating they find a storage room that appears to have been previously completely undiscovered all kinds of artifacts um, they get really excited and Kate Erickson, who is the structural chick of the team, is down there, her and Andre, because, you know, he's the, the man, macho, manly man of the show, um, and they go down to um, recover what they can. So... They're down there, and then all of a sudden they see a glint of something. Or 
I think Kate does. And so she bends over to pick it up and discovers a modern day glass lens. It is a bifocal, but it has um, lime encrustations along one edge where it had been submerged. Well, Andre is convinced that there is no freaking way that the site's been contaminated. It's, it's, you know, calls into question their, their whole dig site and their publications and their work. It's just, you know, it's an utter travesty. So, they inspect one another. There's no open zippers. There's no nothing. There's nowhere it could have fallen from. Well, they get outside. They're examining this. They're like, well, you know, there were glass bifocals in the 1400s. So it's possible, especially since it has all these lime encrustations on it, that it didn't get dropped. So, um, hang on a second. Trying to decide, do I want sparkles or no? I think I do. I think we're gonna go with some liquid sparkle. Um, so, they're looking at this lens, glass lens and trying to figure out where the hell it came from and how it got into the storage room. And um, the storage room that they excavated, by the way, is at the monastery, not at either of the castles. So, <clears throat> they're trying to figure it out, and Chris, who is basically, he's not the professor's son, but the, his, both his parents died, and he went through a rough patch, and the professor was there for him. So, it feels like Professor Johnston is his parent, even though he is technically not just want to clear that up real quick because in the movie they made him his son and it just kind of ruined Chris's backstory. But <clears throat> anyway. Chris notices that this lens looks a lot like the professor's glasses. So he goes and searches. Actually, I can't remember if it's Chris or Andre. It might have been both of them. Anyway, they go into the professor's, um, there's an old farmhouse that they uh, was still standing that they're using as like dormitories. And so they go to the professor's room and um, check his spare glasses that he left behind. And it's an exact replica of the missing lens. And then Elsie radios in and wants to know what the hell they're doing playing a nasty prank like that because she finds a parchment that she has David cross check and it carbon dates, everything checks out, but it's roughly made. So that's why she suspects that it's, it's a really stupid prank um, of a parchment roughly scraped with the professor's handwriting saying help. And um, some other notes and yeah so she starts to get really ill about it because she thinks it's a, a really bad prank well it's not the professor has indeed traveled back in time and gotten stuck so they end up going back ITC um, they can't get a hold of the professor they're supposed to he's supposed to have a check-in every so often and he misses his last check-in. Well, they start getting antsy and um, ITC reaches out, tells them that they've sent a plane, that Professor Johnston needs their help desperately. So Andre, Chris, Kate, and David all get onto the plane and go back to um, Black Rock, New Mexico to ITC headquarters. What has happened is um, the professor found out what was going on, how um, they have been sending observers. They're hiring um, ex-military to go back but not participate, just to observe, to go back in time. And they can actually see 
while um, before it's like I can't remember exactly how many days it's two or three days before uh, the monastery and the castles and everything burns so <clears throat> they can actually see what was there before it's even been excavated in modern times fascinating concept right okay so <clears throat> Let me find my liner brush and then I'll get back to the story. Well, pooey. Um, um, they explain roughly what has happened to the professor. And of course, you know, the students are all in disbelief. You know, that this, this could even be possible. But they're willing to entertain the possibility without proof because of the weirdness of finding the professor's help note and um, his glasses at the monastery in the excavation. So, um, it's a long flight from the state or from France back to the States. So, they have them plug in the um, some headphones and you said, you know, you probably won't learn much, but it'll at least give you a feel for how the language is. And um, they listened to a recording of conversational Ostan. I know, bizarre. Um, and Andre's like, but I already speak Ostan. And he's like, well, you don't know the accents and blah, blah, blah. You know, he's like, yeah, okay. So he learns a little too. Okay, so they fall asleep. Big surprise, because uh, it's a long ass flight. They arrive at the headquarters. Um, they notice weather balloons, and uh, they have perfectly logical explanations for that. And it sounds reasonable. I don't know if it is or isn't, but you know, weather apparently affects um, the machines working perfectly. And um, all this stuff is taking way, way below ground um, in a laboratory, little machines. And so they, uh, they explain it all. They show them what happens. And they say that the professor wandered off. Um, he wasn't supposed to. He was just supposed to go back for a few minutes and then press the little white ceramic. Press the little white ceramic and brings the machine back. You step into it and you come back. Didn't happen. Something went wrong. Of course. You wouldn't have a book if something didn't go wrong, right? Okay, so. They're going to go back in time since they are the leading experts for this time. With two escorts. Um, Gomez and Barreto. And uh, they're going to go back and find the professor and come back. Because the professor only has so long. Um, well, it's not really the professor. It's the rescue team only has so long before the ceramic markers time out. And they won't retrieve a machine. And then you get lost back in the multiverse forever. So... Um, So, they agree. They're going through the training. You know, they say you can't take back anything that would be out of place should it be dropped. So, they supply them, you know, with um, nondescript clothing. You know, nothing super poor, nothing super rich, kind of middle class. Um, they give them little trans uh, translator things that go in their ears. So they can understand what's being said to them. And they look, <clears throat> they cover them in um, like a liquid plastic stuff and mold it to the inside of their ear. And all they got to do is, you know, tap their, their jawline and it turns it on and off. Um, that's an important part. Surprise, surprise. Who knew, right? Uh, so... 
they're going through all that. They give them, you know, the, the best they can, you know, antidiuretics and, um, like, flash bombs and uh, a few other things. And they're all, like, um, made out of basic materials that you could find back then, disguised. Doing the best they can for them without <clears throat> making it out of place where they would draw attention to themselves and, you know, end up burning at the stake or whatever they do in those times. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, they're going through all that and they're, um, they, uh, they're getting ready to go in the machines with Barreto and Gomez. And, uh, they find that Barreto, Gomez is a woman, Barreto is a man. Barreto is a real hard head, and they're not allowed to take guns, of course, because, you know, guns hadn't been invented yet. The longbow and the sword were their main defense uh, weapons of the time. Well, they find that uh, Barreto has a gun and grenades and, you know, all kinds of shit. And he's arguing, saying that they, they've got no way to protect themselves um, should something happen. That they don't know what's going to happen because this trip, they've got to go back and actually participate instead of just watching. And, you know, there's no telling and it's, it's just not smart. And uh, they keep telling him, no, you can't do that because it... They hadn't been invented yet. There's no way to explain it. You don't know what it will do to, <coughs> to the future. You can't have a, um, an anachronism. This is the word they keep using over and over. So, uh, so he finally backs down and agrees and says he's going to leave it all behind. He doesn't. So they're getting ready to go back, and David Stern starts panicking. And he's just like, no, 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 I'm not comfortable with this. I don't know anything about history. I'm all IT, and this really is flipping me out. I can't do it. So he backs out and stays behind, and everybody else leaves. And I can't even begin to describe how cool the process of this sounds. But basically, you know, in less than a minute's time, it's lots of bright lights and flashing and, and these cages that they're in start spinning around and they just start getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until they're microscopic and then poof, they're gone. And uh, anyway, so they arrive on a hillside overlooking the river um, in a wooded area across from the monastery. And... They're looking around and they're like flipping out. They're like, it is so creepy. And it's because there's no noise, because there's no planes, there's no electricity, there's no cars, there's there's no modern conveniences whatsoever. And it's just unnerving for them because they've grown up to the white, it's just, you know, white noise. And so they're back in time. They see the monastery across the river when they start feeling a rumbling in the ground. And then they hear, it's um, horse hooves and shouting. And they're all like, well, hide, hide, you know, and they separate and they all try to hide. Well, Gomez, Gomez and Barreto are having an argument when the others notice the, um, the rumbling and the hoof beats, that's the word I was looking for, hoof beats, um, on the ground because Gomez noticed Barreto pull out uh, a gun that he was supposedly leaving behind. Well, he's got grenades too and she's yelling at him, telling him he's got to put it in the machine and send those back now. It's, it's against what they were told. It's not protocol, blah, 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 blah. When knights... A whole big group of them on horseback come around the bend and pretty much trample Gomez. Barreto freaks out 
and has a grenade in his hand. He was getting ready to put all this stuff back in the machine and send it away. The machines are gone. Disappear quickly. Uh, but before they do, the grenade that was in his hand, he's pulled the pin somehow, and it has rolled into the machine. So, and then uh, he gets run through with the sword by uh, one of the knights and flies backward into the machine with the grenade. Well, Bretto has been trampled completely. They're chasing a small boy who runs past shouting something that they can't understand because they don't have the translators on yet. And they uh, have no idea what the hell is going on. So they're hiding in bushes and covered in mud and just flipping out. I know I would be. So the knights lose the boy who climbed a tree, by the way. They get angry because they lost their prey and uh, just basically trample Gomez's body over and over and over again because they're just angry. And then they finally ride off. Um, now, Andre and Kate are in one spot. Chris was further up, and so he's separated from them. And he's closer to where the boy is. So him and the boy are going in one direction, and Kate and Andre are in another. And it, it ends, they, they end up separating. Well, the boy turns out to be Lady Claire, who is um, trying... She's kind of captive and kind of not. Um, she is English and was married. She's a widow. Uh, was married to uh, a French nobleman. And um, he's passed. And she's trying to save her um, properties. Because, you know, women didn't have rights. So whatever properties she had through marriage will go to whomever she is married, hence the hunting. Um, and she is under the guardianship of Lord Oliver, who currently is an English lord. He has um, possession of Castle Guard and La Roque. So she's trying to get to um, the abbot at the monastery of St. Mare, which is uh, the Virgin Mary. Anyway, I'm losing, I'm getting lost in side bits. Um, she's trying to get to the abbot so she can get out a message for help um, to escape the marriage that Sir Oliver is trying to push her into. With the knight that basically trampled Gomez. Gomez had a spare ceramic marker with her. So the one that gets crushed, it's, it's okay. She's got one slipped into her wig, which Kate noticed. Because, you know, when they were getting dressed in their medieval clothing, of course, the guys were in one room, the girls were in another. So she noticed Gomez stick the spare nav marker, as they call them in um, her wig because she's got shorter hair and you can't have short hair because that's you know another giveaway that you are a, a low person or something is wrong with you you're diseased or a whore or whatever you know um, so that's interesting I just you know I like that kind of stuff and it's historically true um, sorry this is harder to do. I don't know if I'm going to continue doing makeup and book reviews. Because it's, it's really hard to do both. I get distracted by one or the other. We shall see. Okay. So. 
Lady Claire and Chris end up back in Castle Guard because he follows her. And while there, he's, he's trying um, to figure out what she's saying and, and respond in a way that's not too obvious that he's got no freaking clue. And she asks if he's a gentle. And she thinks he's from Ireland because of his weird accent and the way he speaks. Um, so... Um, yeah, I'm searching for a couple of brushes. Hang on. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> Lady Claire asks if he's a gentle. And if you're a gentle, that means you were born gently, um, that you are of the noble class. Um, that you're not a peasant and he he answers that yes because he th thinks that she means you know his disposition <laughs> which I don't know why the hell he would think that but anyway that's what he thinks she's getting at so he replies yes he's gentle so she thinks she has found herself a squire to take up her cause to save her lands and this crappy ass dude that Sir Oliver's trying to marry her off to. Sir Oliver is no relation whatsoever to this woman too, by the way. Um, so she's just been appointed a guardian. I don't know how the mechanics of that would work in medieval times. Anyway, so she is making her play using Chris, and he is completely clueless as to what's going on. Meanwhile, Kate and Andre get the spare marker, and it's a countdown, and a little, um, it's like a twist of rope, like for a bracelet, and inside is a little flip thing where they've got a countdown so that they know when um, the markers expire. So they know they've got, you know, so much time to get back. Well, they <clears throat> I really did put that up. Okay. They um, they notice across the way the monastery and they see Professor Johnston. And so that's where they head, because they know they need to get Professor Johnston, and they need to get their asses back. They'll, they'll get Chris later. And Professor Johnston has been captured by Sir Oliver, and that's what went wrong. He um, couldn't get away from Sir Oliver or explain, because he appeared in a magical flash of lights, and... Um, Sir Oliver's key, I don't know if you'd say key advisor, main advisor, the dude he trusts above all other, and so Oliver is a real jackass too, just so you know, um, a pig, just very low, and <clears throat> put some lips on and we'll say I'm done with the makeup, uh, anyway, His main advisor, Robert de Kerr, doesn't trust anyone. He's very paranoid. And so is Sir Oliver. And Sir Oliver is worried because the archpriest, uh, funky name, they call him the archpriest because the rumor is that he was um, supposed to have been a priest and got defrocked for some reason or another, are not disavowed. And he is on the march going to um, take back the territories from Sir Oliver for the French. So he's really paranoid about spies. And everybody is, is working for the archpriest. And LaRoque is supposed to be completely 
impenetrable. You just, you can't get it. Except that whoever designed it um, designed a secret passage in it and he doesn't know where it is because um, the monk who designed it has passed away. So Professor Johnston, if he wants to live, has to provide him with where the secret passage is so he can defend it and keep the archpriest from taking territories away from him. So, yeah, I know it's, it's a really good breed, though, I swear. It's just really hard to describe. Um, so, that's what Professor Johnston, that's how he got waylaid. He was um, basically, you know, taken hostage by Sir Oliver's men. So, He's searching in the monastery records. Um, Brother Marcel is the one who, uh, and the former abbot before him, were the ones who um, helped design and build the rogue. And so he's searching through all the records trying to find out where the secret passage is so he can make uh, Sir Oliver happy and get free. Well, they're not having a whole lot of luck. And... Uh, I'm cleaning brushes while I'm talking. Sorry. His time is up. Sir Oliver is retrieving him back to Castle Guard. And um, Kate and Andre follow him back to Castle Guard. Well, Lady Claire has revealed herself to be a woman. And Chris. And they've got all their little earpiece things on now. And they see Professor Johnston. And... Mm. Sir Oliver asks Lady Clare what she was doing outside of the castle and why was she running from her protectors, you know, the knights that were chasing her down. Why was she running from them? They were there for her own good and, you know, all this other stuff. Well, she basically tells them that, um, that the knights were up to no good and that she feared for her life and that Chris is her savior and Merrick, Andre Merrick advises Chris to keep his mouth shut, don't reply to anything, don't, don't agree and they ask him questions in a way that Chris just doesn't have a clue what's going on. He's just clueless as to customs and ends up being challenged by the knight whom I cannot remember. It's, it's the black knight. And there's a green knight. And Yeah, okay. And uh, ends up being challenged to a joust, basically. And there's a tourney going on anyway. And Andre is like, oh, you poor bastard. You know, you really screwed up. Because Chris did exactly what he told him not to do. Because it didn't make sense. Because Chris was clueless. Well, then Professor Johnston shows up, and he's like, no, I've got, my assistants are here, you know, because they, they come forward for Professor, and it's just, it proceeds on. It's all a search to find the secret passageway, and um, it's not the Green Knight, it's a Green Chapel. The Green Chapel is the key to finding the secret passageway, which you find later in the book. And, you know, they go through all kinds of intrigues and um, adventures and stuff and um, they finally do end up all together um, and Robert DeCare doesn't trust any of them at all as far as he can trust them. He knows something's up and they can't figure out how he keeps finding them. They, um, they hide in a house that um, had been stricken with black the Black Plague. It has come through this village um, several times through the timeline. Sorry. It has. Um, they hide in there. He finds them. They escape um, lockup and he knows exactly how they've escaped and where they are. They just, they're just they really puzzled by all of this. Well, meanwhile, back at ITC, David Stern, Barreto <coughs> and the machines come back and 
promptly blow apart because of the grenade. So there's no way for the others to come back, even if they were successful and hit the nav marker to come back. So David Stern is there trying to figure out how to redo it. Well, it, it takes time because they've got to clear the air of all the toxic fumes <clears throat> from where things were exploded. Um, they have water shields, which helps prevent the transcription errors. And then he learns about transcription errors with Willisley the cat, who has major transcription errors. And um, his face is all misshapen, and he attacks the cage bars over and over and over and doesn't stop and won't stop, as they found out, until you actually leave the room and all is quiet. If there's anything at all that he'll notice, he'll attack the bars and he'll injure himself and still keep attacking. So, um, the transcription errors are just um, significant. They're, you know, neurological as well. So, they get the air cleared and the water shields are critical to prevent transcription errors so they don't end up really screwed up like Wellesley. Um, the problem is they do have a backup set of the machines um, and they have some water shields but they have to fill them and there's pitting from where acid from the explosion etched and um, pitted the, the glass so they don't know if they've got enough water shields to completely protect everybody and they don't know if um, once the water is filled in these water shield tanks, their huge glass tanks curved um, to protect around the machines, uh, they don't know if they'll explode from the pressure of the water once they're completely filled. So David Stern is on this problem trying to figure it out and they have a monitor um, that shows the probability of a return that they can measure from experience, you know, how soon someone will be coming back. And they have no way of um, letting the people know that the site is down and that they can't come back. So, you know, it's all just this horrible timing kind of thing. And so <clears throat> David is on that end trying to figure it out, and he finally does. And I won't, I won't spoil the ending for you and tell you how he figures out a way to fix the shields and still be able to fill them fast, um, which is, you know, the main issue on their side. Back in feudal France, 1357... They, um, where were we? Oh, um, Chris has been challenged by the Black Knight. So, Andre tells him, as bad as Chris is at jousting, that he's going to be knocked off. It's going to hurt like hell. When you are knocked off your horse, stay down. That'll end the joust, and that should be it. Well, that's exactly what happens. Chris gets knocked from his horse. Uh, he hurts like hell, just like Andre told him he would. But then the Black Knight decides to go after him and is going to run him through or trample him like he did Gomez. Andre calls dirty and runs out on the tourney field and tries to um, save Chris. Well, this, you know, it's all a big dramatic scene. Sir Oliver decides that Andre and Chris were playing dirty and they didn't follow the correct rules of engagement and so they're thrown into the dungeon. Well, Kate, because she's a female, uh, she was observing with the rest of the fans, I guess, for the tourney that was going on anyway. She uh, ends up getting them out. Um, they escape. Dakar finds them. They get locked up, they escape, Dakar finds them. It's all just a horrible mess. And uh, this just enrages Sir Oliver because these are Professor Johnston's, um, they call him uh, a magister. 
He's supposed to be a magician. Yeah. Uh, he claims to be from Oxford, which had been established barely. Anyway, so Professor Johnston is a, a visiting super smart guy, so smart he seems like he has Merlin abilities, right? So Sir Oliver's getting really aggravated with uh, Professor Johnston's assistant's behavior, that they are constantly misbehaving and doing things against custom. And uh, de Care says this is just further evidence, you know, that they can't be trusted. They're spies. They're French spies. And uh, he says that Professor Johnston has to provide Greek fire to prove his worth and loyalties. So that's what Sir Oliver demands, Professor Johnston. Well, he says, no problem. Problem is, nobody knows what Greek fire is today. Certainly not Professor Johnston. So he and um, the assistants start grind it describes it in the book in detail basically it's poop animal poop and they're grinding it into a fine fine powdery making it a paste and he is making automatic fire and um this doesn't this is what it's um I keep wanting to say quick lime, and I know that's wrong. Uh, quick lime's part of the process, though. So, uh, Back droppings, guano. Basically, it's a paste, and when it hits water, it automatically starts fire. Uh, the more water you put on, the more it spreads, but it's highly volatile. So after his demonstration, he's got all kinds of people working on it. It's just him and Andre, uh, Chris and Kate have separated out and have gone in search of the secret passageway. They find, they figure out the clues, they follow it through the green passage, they make their way in, they're all joined up when um, the archpriest who captures Kate and Chris on their lovely green chapel adventure, he's following them after he... Um, interrogates them and then he lets them go on Lady Claire's word. This is another intrigue of hers. So they follow. He gets inside the walls. The war is starting. It's all going out. Chris is like, you know, Lady Claire is such a two-faced lying bitch. And Andre's like, no, she's a, a clever woman of her time. You know, he admires the intrigues employees. She's amusing to try and save her her wealth and uh anyway the war is going on and and uh <clears throat> they're in the in the meantime also they have abandoned castle guard for the more defensible laroque and so the professor and andre are the ones sitting there making the automatic fire well chris and kate escape they get there they all um, meet up and they're crossing. They've got to have so much space for the machines to be able to return and pick them up. So the inner courtyard that they're in is too small. So they have to go to, uh, I can't remember if it's a bailey or an outer courtyard or what the correct um, terminology is. But <clears throat> as they're trying to do that, Chris is being taunted by Robert DeCurr. Surprise, surprise, with an earpiece. Guess who has too many transcription errors and decided to stay behind? Robert DeCare. He's like Wellesley. That's why he's so paranoid. He is ex-military, and um, in modern times, he was Robert Deckard. And um, he was a linguist with the military. could pick up somebody's uh, language with just a few conversations, you know, a few sentences in, he would start to pick it up and piece it together. You know, he just had a natural ability for languages. So he speaks like a native by this point. Um, I think he had been back for almost a year in that time, and he has become Sir Oliver's top advisor. 
So uh, he knows all about them, and he went back and got uh, Gomez's earpiece and shoved it in his and has been listening in on everything going on, and um, he just wants to kill them. Kind of like Willis Lee the cat, you know, kept banging against the cage bars even after being hurt. He's paranoid this way and just wants to kill. Great time for him, right? Feudal France. So, um, he and Chris end up battling it out. Andre ends up in it. He gets sliced down the face with the sword tip. Um, they killed Dakar finally. Deckard, however you want to call him. The crazy guy. They finally, they're, um, they finally get to the outer, outmost courtyard area, wherever they'll have enough room to summon the cages back. And um, they do so. Well, Andre is still fighting with, you know, because there's basically a war going on around them, a huge battle. And he's still battling to get to them, and he's, he's like, go, go without me, I'll stay. So they do. Okay, well, let's flip back to ITC in current times before they summon the cages. Doniger is aware of the explosion and the possibility of not being able to retrieve any of them and is trying to figure out the quickest way to minimize the damage um, that this is going to do with what he wants from the board of directors. He's just a complete asshole. He's like, eh, get rid of them. You know, leave them behind. Not a big deal. Just being a complete jerk and uh, they're like you know well we've got shields we've got the spear machines we can still get them back but there may be transcription errors and he's like no the press would be a nightmare we can't do that if there are going to be any transcription errors don't do it at all just leave them abandon them in in 1357 and uh, so this is all going on David Stern figures out a way to repair the water shields and fill them rapidly because the repair process takes a little bit of time. So they've got to be able to repair or fill them, you know, like fast. So they're using fire hoses to rapid fill the water tanks, these water shields. So they do that. Um, everybody comes back successfully. And then uh, Kramer, the attorney, and Dr. Gordon, the ex-military vice president guy, They've decided they've had enough. Excuse me. I can feel a hair. Brush hair tickling me. Um, they've had enough of Doniger's antics and just bad behavior in general. And there'd been a rumor in the company, you know, that if you stepped out of line, if you um, spoke about what was going on, that they would send you back to, like, um, Mount Vesuvius the day it erupted and, you know, really bad things like that. Well... They uh, basically kidnap Doniger and they send him back. And he's like, ah, oh, no big deal. He's got a spare nav marker in his shoe. But since he's back, he's going to take a look around and see what it's actually like since he is already back in time. And so he is walking around. And he's realizing, he's like, ah, oh, no big deal. It's Castle Guard. I'm in the Dordogne Valley. I know exactly where I'm at. So he's walking around. He's looking. And just enjoying himself, just casually strolling down the village street. And then he notices the cart of dead bodies. Yeah, they sent him back in the middle of the Black Plague outbreak. And then he starts to choke and cough. Guess who's gonna die? <laughs> so, and it just kind of leaves you with that impression without the dude actually dying. Um, then it goes to uh, Professor Johnston, Kate, and Chris, who successfully came back. They're back at um, overseas, you know, France. Elsie has been tracing Andre's life. Um, he becomes Andrew. But she still finds him in the historical record since he is a um, Teutonic Knight. And Traces him and Lady Claire, whom he decides to stay in champion, and um, their progress in history. And they trace it back to um, where they were buried at, at um, 
Eltham Chapel, which is uh, Lady Clare was at Eltham, and that's the lands she was trying to protect and save. Well, you know, if they go back and trace it and find his grave, and um, it's got a carving of him and Lady Clare that they decide looks very much like the actual people that they met. And, uh, yeah, it's just a fascinating read. Um, I love Michael Crichton. just can't say enough good things about him. Died way too young. But, anyway, uh, check it out. You can probably find this book at um, your local library. If they've got a, a digital lending service, it'll probably be available since it is a, a much older book. Um... I have, <laughs> it's really bad, I have it in hardback, paperback, and digital. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I just, I have to have this book with me at all times. I, I, it's a favorite. When I can't find anything good to read, I fall back on Timeline, mm -hmm. Jurassic Park, The Lost World, I didn't like as much. Um, I also I have Congo, I don't have it in... Uh, physical form. It's just digital. It's also a great read and absolutely nothing like the movie. The only thing that's similar are the names. Um, but the movie's still good too. The book's just way better. Um, and my next book review, I don't, I'm not sure what I want to do. Um, probably something that I'm reading now. Um, I finished the Witcher series. I'm looking for a new book now, so, you know, I'll have read something by next Friday. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, definitely check out Timeline if it sounds interesting at all to you. I appreciate you watching, subscribing, and if you wouldn't mind, maybe give my video a like. It always helps with the algorithm. And, um, Keep your eyes open. I'll be getting boxes in the mail soon to unbox and uh, be doing a Halloween house tour before you know it. I've started decorating. I'm not quite done, but it's getting close. So uh, keep your eyes on here. Check me out on Instagram. Same name, Jan Does Reviews. And um, hope you guys stay safe. Bye.